Welcome to Mysterious Goings On. We're going to get right to the show after these messages. Hi, this is Priyanka Lalwani, composer of the film The Strange Guest. And you are listening to me on the podcast Mysterious Goings On with the awesome host Alexander Greenwood. This podcast features writers and highlights their creativity, writing and mystery. Check it out at mgopod.com. You know, I'm a big fan of getting back to nature. I just got back um, from two forms of nature uh, as of this recording. One was a cabin in the woods in the Midwest, and the other was uh, the beach in uh, southern Florida. And so I got kind of the best of both worlds for me. And in between here in Kansas City, Missouri, where I reside, I often go hike over to a local nature park and walk the trails and do a little bit of forest bathing. I find it very restorative, and that's why I'm pretty excited to speak with our guest today who has written a wonderful memoir about her own relationship to nature and how it may well have, if not saved her life, it definitely saved her quality of life. We're welcoming Sandra Shaw Homer, who relocated to Costa Rica from the U.S. three decades ago and saw her entire life turned upside down. She has a lot of stuff to tell us about it. Um, And her beautiful memoir, Evelio's Garden, tells an encouraging story for each of us and for the environment. Sandra Shaw Homer, welcome to Mysterious Goings On. Thank you. It's a delight to be here, Alex. So, Sandra, Costa Rica. Hmm. I want to tell you something. I... um, I, I, I you know, used to be kind of just a ha-ha joke with my uh, college roommate and his family, but the I mean, you know, as I get closer to retirement, I've really been doing some research on Costa Rica. Um, you tell me. <laughs> of course, I'm going to read the book. You tell me, though. Is Costa Rica all that and more? Yes. Yes, it is. And there are, I just learned this the other day, about 150,000 foreigners living in Costa Rica, many of them from the United States and Canada, some from Europe. Uh, I was astounded at the number, but many of them, of course, are retirees. So um, there are beach people, uh, you know, people who retire on the beach and people who retire up where I live, which is on Lake Arenal, which is in the highlands of Costa Rica. I'm at um, 573 meters of altitude. So that's cool here. it's, it's fresh. That's the word they use in Spanish, fresco. Um, so it, um, I, I, I can't take the heat on the beach, you know, for a weekend, sure, but I can't, I can't stay there all the time. It's just too hot for me. You, you but, know, I experienced that as well. It just uh, We were in Key West and uh, just wandering around for an afternoon can drain you completely. Yes, yes. It's very enervating, very enervating. So where I live, um, it's in a cabin close to the lake. I can see the lake through the trees. There's some magnificent, huge old trees on this property. And um, it's, uh, if you have to be able to tolerate uh, the rain. It, it does rain here. <laughs> you know, we're, we're in the tropics and there are basically two seasons in the tropics and one is rainy season and the other is windy season. Or as somebody recently put it on Facebook, we have a uh, a rainy season and then we have a windy rainy season. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, you know, the, the the late great Joe Cocker had an album called "I Can Stand a Little Rain." You know, and maybe it's more than a little rain, but it sounds it still sounds idyllic to me. Well, it is a, it is beautiful, and uh, but this the weather is changing, and I have to I have to admit that it's just. Uh, uh, we're getting more rain, more heavy rain. Yeah. Uh, it, it comes down on the roof so hard you wonder if the roof is going to hold up. Oh, wow. Uh, it, it really is noisy. And um, uh, what this does is fill the lake up, which is nice because the lake is uh, a, the center of a major hydroelectric project that was built back in the early 70s. And um, it feeds three hydro projects um turbine turbine plants 
going down the hill from us to the lowlands. Um, and so it's a major generator of electricity in Costa Rica. Uh, at, at one point, it was up to 85% of the, the energy being produced in this country was the wow. electric. Now we're, it's being uh, challenged by uh, wind towers. We have lots of wind towers around the lake. As I mentioned, it can be windy. Mm -hmm. And so they're taking advantage of it. Uh, and I think the wind is now um, providing 15% of our energy profile. So, and there's solar also, as well as um, um, not so much solar, but there's um, drilling into the mountainsides for heat and bringing it up to run turbines and steam, turning it into steam and running turbines and then returning the the water to the earth it's an interesting process uh geothermal they call mm. it uh generation and it's um that's beginning to take a substantial uh, percentage of our energy profile as well so costa rica is a pretty uh um energy efficient country would you would you say it's self-sufficient to a large degree is there a, or is there required or is it dependent on heavy trade with other nations to get the well, basics well it's not yeah it's not 100% it's not 100% there are times of the year you know during dry season for example when we're not getting enough rain to to uh, keep the hydro going as fully as they would like um the um, we have to tap into the central american grid um but that's the the less we do that, the better, and we and we're trying very hard not to. Right. Uh, we had um, over 300 days of uh, of uh, no fossil fuel generation um, last year. It was just incredible. Wow. Yeah. That blows my mind. Well, you know, I, I appreciate you kind of bringing us up to speed a little bit about it, but let's let's go back if we could, and of course, which is the, the basis of the memoir. But do you mind giving us uh, the overview about your journey that that brought you? to Costa Rica. <laughs> that was interesting. Um, it was really uh, serendipitous. Uh, we, um, uh, my ex-husband and I um, were in a business together, a public relations business. And um, we were just simply overwhelmed. We were getting burned out, like really burned out. And um, we're looking for a, a kinder climate. Philadelphia was not a very kind <laughs> climate. Right. And uh, just a more relaxed atmosphere and the chance to do the things that, you know, retirees like to do. So my husband liked to fish and, uh, and garden, and uh, I really wanted to settle down and start writing seriously. I'd been mm. writing for other people all my career, but now I wanted to write for myself. So um, we just happened to run into an honorary consul from Costa Rica, and she was um, very helpful and explained to us how easy it was to get residency here. You know, it's not all that easy to move to another country. Yeah. Um, not many countries are all that welcoming, uh, but Costa Rica was at that time very welcoming. And they were looking for US dollars, in fact, to generate you know, a little bit more uh, economic security. And um, so we came down here and explored and looked around and found a, a wonderful house on a, a piece of high ground in the Central Valley looking looking over the mountains to the south. And uh, I just filled up. Uh, I, I grew up in the country, but I'd been living in cities all my adult life. And uh, coming back to the country for me was just uh, absolutely magnificent. But it was, it took about a year and a half for us to sell our house, our business, and, uh, and get ourselves organized for the move. But it was um, it was worth it, absolutely worth it. Uh, I uh, sent some parallels here, by the way. I, I, public relations is my day job, and uh, my mm -hmm. spouse is also in PR. So we all we all understand all too well, and of course the urge to uh, get away. Our thoughts are just to get away from what can be fairly brutal winters as we get older, especially. It just seems like every year, the the prospect of shoveling uh, the driveway, etc. It just becomes more and more of a Ugh, no thank you so um mm -hmm. it's something we're leaning towards but um but but a lot started to happen to you and with you when you when you made this move right 
Yeah, unfortunately, my husband was a heavy drinker. I mean, the advertising and PR business, you, I'm sure you're aware, tends mm -hmm. to be filled with people who do a lot of uh, three martini lunches. And um, I don't know, I, th I, I felt that a move like this would really help to save our marriage as a marriage, because as partners in a business, you know, you're not really a married couple. You're um, usually very angry at each other. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, my. <laughs> so um, I thought that this would be a good move. And uh, but it turned out that uh, my husband didn't adapt very well. He um, he felt diminished by the loss of his prestige. He had enjoyed quite a lot of prestige in his profession in Philadelphia. And um, uh, he started drinking very heavily. I mean, the first thing in the morning, drinking. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Wow. And um, the maid was telling me she was finding bottles of vodka all over the house. And uh, uh, it was, you know, when you're married to an alcoholic, you can you try uh, again and again and again to, to help to get them to go to AA, to get them to go to a, a counselor, to uh, get them to stop drinking. Yeah. Uh, and you keep failing. Uh, this is a, there's no way another person can can make an alcoholic change his mind, and um, so he he didn't. And uh, I finally had to say I needed a life of my own, not not completely dedicated to to um, to his life. And so we split uh, about six years after moving here, and um, it turned into a very rough divorce. But it, um, it lasted about two years until we finally sat down at a table with a couple of lawyers and, and got an agreement going. But it was, um, it was tough because uh, the little bit of money that I was getting was barely enough. Right. I moved into a tiny rental place and uh, um, uh, fortunately, uh, unfortunately, I wasn't yet getting Social Security. So... Uh, it was, it was rough times there for a few years, um, poverty time. But, you know, you survive. Yeah. You, you learn to survive. I, I lived in Manhattan on a very, very low salary for a long time. So I yeah. can, I, I've been poor before, so I, I figured I could make it again. And I did. I did. You know, there's there's something about finding that I I've, I had a similar thing happen to me, not completely the same, but uh, back in the day with another relationship. And you, you I think you find uh, some things within yourself when you go through trials like this. Uh, at least I did, uh, and I kind of figured out something that uh, I, I was tougher than I thought I was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you have to, you know, survival is is. Uh... And it was necessary, <laughs> so you just <laughs> you just do what you have to do. I fortunately had friends in the Tico community who got me work very quickly, teaching English uh, hmm. to uh, as a second language uh, to to groups uh, at night in in Tiladan, the town near where I live. And um, then I also found myself managing properties for absentee owners, and uh, then I was getting involved with the. Uh, interpreting in lawyers offices for uh, um, sales contracts and and labor issues and so on and so i was picking up enough money here and there uh oh and i was giving swimming lessons and piano lessons I was oh wow <laughs> turning myself to whatever i possibly could and so i survived i survived yeah and in evelio's garden you, you you're telling this this story um and it, it parallels not only um, the the healing power of, of this garden and of this of nature, but also um, talking about how we must protect the environment. Can you can you elaborate on that? I got involved in that kind of accidentally. Um, uh, uh, the local office of the environmental ministry in Costa Rica uh, didn't even have a truck to go around and inspect and see what people were doing. Uh, and they were not really aware of what was happening on the lake. There was illegal logging going on, for one thing. And uh, I offered the services of my car to take an inspector down to a place where there was illegal logging taking place. And, and um, 
the first time I saw a six foot diameter tree on the ground, illegally cut, oh my. Uh, I just, something snapped in me. I, I, could, I could understand the economic reasons for cutting it down, but I couldn't see how any human being could have done it. It's just, uh, a tree is, is, is a living, breathing creature. And uh, anyway, so I, I got very involved in the environmental movement locally. Um, in fact, I was, I was given the job of uh, presiding over the, the Municipal Environmental Commission. And uh, we also had a, a private group um, that was dedicated to reforestation. We, we planted 10,000 trees around the lake, uh, uh, got involved with a group that was trying to protect the lake area from uh, development. You know, big money developers were coming in and trying to build condos and gated communities and so on. And they were completely ignoring the environmental legislation, hmm. just completely. And so we had to bring those situations to the attention of the, the relevant ministries. And um, we, got them, we got them stopped. We got some stopped. We also had a chance to uh, stop a sawmill that was in the middle of a residential area. Hmm. And we got the municipal dump closed. And so you know, we got a few things done. I feel pretty good about that. But it was work. I was working almost full time at a job of, of working with these three, uh, three environmental organizations. And um, I finally just got tired. You know, I'm not as young as I was. And uh, uh, besides, I was still writing for other people. I wanted to write for myself. So yep. I stopped. I stopped that work. But it really put me closer to the urgency of uh, our protecting of our natural environment. And uh, and now uh, I just find I can't live without it. It's, it's become a part of me. And uh, it's, um, for me, it's, all, it's really almost a spiritual thing. Um, I connect to it at that level. Well, your, your memoir highlights living as a naturalist in Costa Rica and focuses on an organic garden that's planted on your property by Evelio, who helped build your house. Is that correct? That's right. Um, so how, how I'd love to know, how does the garden, and uh, I, I believe you had a, a serious health detour, some other things, how did it force you to make sense of your past? How did it help you with that? Uh, well, for one thing, this is a different culture. You have to remember when you move to another country, you're moving into another culture completely. And this culture is still here in rural Costa Rica, still very family-based. Uh, they still remember and what it was like living on self-sustaining plots of land uh, where the only transportation was on four legs and the, uh, you had to plant your own corn, your own coffee. You had to have uh, the ability to, uh, to thresh grain, uh, you know, they were just completely isolated, self-sustaining farms. And a lot of the people around here still remember, they have a very, very clear memory of, of what that was like, growing up in a house with a dirt floor, for example, um, making your own cheese. A lot of women around here still make their own farm cheese. Mm. Um, so, but the culture is, um, it's kind of like it moved from the 19th century into the 21st and skipped the 20th. Um, suddenly everybody's got a cell phone, for example. Hmm. Um, but that was not true when we first got here. It was like, it was really like a time work. It was like moving backwards in time. Hmm. Yeah. Is there, um, uh, was there any pushback on, on the environmental? I mean, you, I understand that in some countries, particularly countries that, I'm not saying Costa Rica has this, but countries that have poverty, uh, parts of Brazil, obviously, the rainforest is going because simply because it's sometimes it's beyond just the moneyed interest, right? It's also just people just trying to, as you mentioned earlier, eking out um, survival on the land. And they don't have, the, I guess, the privilege or uh, of 
or feel the prerogative of having to take care of the environment. They're just trying to take care of their family. Is that is that fair that's to right. say? Okay. That's very, that's very fair to say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's not to say that there aren't big money interests involved also, but the 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 real truth of the matter is that people living in this rural area, rural areas of Costa Rica still have a very vivid memory of of what it was like uh, and still is like uh, on the indigenous reservations, for example, they, they're still living that style, that lifestyle. So I brought up the cultural differences because um, I found that my personal values, which had been big city values, <laughs> uh, were changing as I had more and more contact with the Velio and his garden. And I, I felt more connected to my inner self, um, things that I had been ignoring in my, in my own personhood, if you will, uh, started to come to the fore. And um, I realized I had, to, uh, I had to go about the business of, of connecting my former self with my current self. And that's why the memoir, that's, and uh, um, it was important for me to get that, get that in perspective, in my new perspective, because I see things very differently now from what I did 30 years ago. Is there something primarily that you see differently? Something that would just the most stark contrast to what you believe 30 years ago? Commercialism. Mm. And, and here, here we are both, you're a former PR person, I'm still a PR a professional. And uh, that's, uh, as a quick aside, that's something that's just kind of bothering me as I get older too. It's just, I sometimes feel like it's also pointless and it's all, it's, it's neglecting so many of the, of the values that, that human beings have because it's this constant, um, well, we're, we're constantly chasing the dollar or chasing material things and you can't take any of it with you. No, and no. I see so many people who are so saddened when they get a lot of the toys they want and they don't change their lives whatsoever. Yes, I think you're right. And it, living a simpler lifestyle helps. It really does. Uh, the, um, as an, uh, also, the people here are kind. I have to say I spent 30 days in this country and it did not hear a single rude word. Hmm. It was just amazing to me when I realized that. You know, coming from Philadelphia, you, know, you get into a taxi and, where are you going, lady? You know. <laughs> here, here, I had a wonderful experience here climbing into a taxi, and I'd been in the hospital for some tests. And, uh, and it had been a painful process, and I was in an ugly mood and uh, climbed into the taxi. And, and he said, how are you doing? And I said, well, not very well. So he launched into a story, which turned out to be, a shaggy dog story. <laughs> you know what that is? Yeah. Okay. I do, yes. <laughs> it, it went on for the entire trip back to the apartment. And I didn't realize it was a shaggy dog story, of course, until the very end. And I cracked <laughs> up and I realized this man had taken the trouble to try to change my mood and make me feel better. Yeah. Uh, and that was so kind. Uh, there's an essential kindness in the culture here. Uh, as an example, another example, I, I had an automobile accident on December 25th, and oh. uh, it was I didn't hit anybody else, but I but I I totaled my car, and uh, I was just kind of stuck in the driver's seat, uh, not able to move um, because of the pain, and my my chest had hit the steering wheel, the the, the airbag didn't inflate. Oh, and so, yeah, and I just uh, I, I couldn't move and. A couple of uh, big SUVs drove by, probably driven by gringos, and then two cars stopped almost immediately, Tico guys. Um, one of them got on his phone and called an ambulance. Uh, the other tried to help me uh, get out of the car, but uh, he, he didn't have any success. The Red Cross had to, had to get me out. Um, but it was the Ticos who, we call them Ticos, who stopped and helped me. Uh, they always do. Uh, they don't just drive past. If they see a problem, they they stop and try to help. Well, that's that's a, uh, that's, a, that's another part of this culture that I value very highly. 
Yeah, and it, of course, it's that those I think Samaritans and people helping out. That's still not something that's completely vanished from from our society here in the United States. But it, it's it's just, but it's just um, kind of more icing on the cake to hear that in Costa that is just the way things are done. You know that um, people help and that, that there's no thought of, uh, of of driving past most for most people no. uh, when you see someone uh, clearly in an extremist so that that's wonderful that's wonderful well let's if we could let's talk a little bit about the writing um now this is not your first book and i've got to say i wish uh i wish i i'm going to, it's on my list um about uh, the letters from the pacific book by the way yes uh, about your 49 day journey on a cargo ship are yes. you kidding me tell me a little please <laughs> about this i gotta know I don't know. I think I have an adventurous spirit, um, you know, moving to another country. <laughs> no kidding. Getting on, a, getting on a cargo ship. and not, I really had always had this kind of fantasy about climbing on board a cargo ship and writing a book. So that's what I did. Uh, I was not at all interested in a cruise, you know, 3,000 other passengers, 24-hour yeah. day food, entertainment, gambling, you know. No, no, no. I wanted the ocean. That's that's nature. Also, I grew up uh, around um, the ocean. Uh, I had a lot of exposure to it growing up, and uh, had always felt something very special about the water. And so, I wanted to be on the water on a ship, a working ship, and um, experiencing what that was like, and experiencing also this just the simple eternity of the ocean. This Ooh. is magical, just magical. Okay, but Senator, I've got to ask though, did you just uh, call up the cargo ship company and say, I want to be a passenger and hang around? How did that work? <laughs> there happened to be some uh, travel agencies that specialize in, in car cargo travel. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I, I found them online. So <laughs> I shouldn't have asked because now it's, it's a little less romantic. I just Googled it and found it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So, what were the accommodations like? Uh, I've just, I've just dying to know. Was it? Absolutely did you? Were you absolutely comfortable? Absolutely comfortable. The room uh, had uh, two beds. Uh, uh, there was a um, uh, a, a porthole, a, a fairly big one, I could open and huh. get fresh air. Um, there was a, a lot of closet space, hanging hanging locker, as well as drawers everywhere. Um, you know, when you're on a, if, I don't know if you've ever been on a boat, but any boat, you, you've got to have storage space. Mm -hmm. And so it's very, they're very inventive, you know, on yachts, for example, you know, see, it's, um, th there'll be little nooks and crannies everywhere where you can put things. And uh, so I had a, a nice ample bedside table and under the beds were drawers, big drawers. Uh, there was a desk, a chair a lamp, um, a bathroom, a complete bathroom, uh, not with a tub, but with a shower. And uh, uh, it, it was perfectly comfortable. I had it all to myself. And um, it couldn't have been more, ha you know, just more comfortable. And, at, and, and when the ship was moving, I just felt like I had returned to the womb. I don't know. There was something wonderful about moving across the water like that. Like the, the, maybe the hum and the thrum of the ship itself. Yeah. Uh, would you find that? Yeah, I've always found that comforting, that beneath my feet, uh, the deck, you know. Um, uh, well, it fascinates me. And um, so you wrote a book about that. And you've written a couple other books, uh, Journey to the Joie de Vivre. And what's mm -hmm. that about? Well, that was another uh, trip. Uh, I, I took a freighter across the Atlantic and... Um, spent some time in Europe visiting friends, people that I had met, um, including some that I had met uh, on board ship. And uh, I just sort of traveled through Italy and uh, Switzerland and France, basically. My sister happened to be uh, on that side of the world um, at the same time. And so we agreed to meet up in Paris for a few days. And that was just heaven. She speaks fluent French, by the way, which just really made things a lot easier for me. But um, uh, my my high school French was not very adequate. But uh, so it was it was just a, a magical trip, and uh, I ended up uh, spending some time in Normandy, 
I had extra time because the ship I was supposed to travel home on was canceled. Hmm. And um, the travel agent who was in Marseille uh, was just scrambling to find me a way back home at that, you know, that time of year. It was summertime. And so that's when everybody wants to travel. Right. Um, uh, anyway, she found me a, a rust bucket out of Le Havre, which, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, this really was a rust bucket. Uh, and there was no elevator, and you had to climb six flights of stairs to get up to your room and six Ooh. flights of stairs down to the mess in order to eat. And it was less than comfortable, but it was an enjoyable voyage. Uh, and <laughs> even so, there was another interesting passenger on board, and uh, um, you get to know the crew. And, you know, it's just... Uh, it's a kind of family atmosphere, basically being on a ship like that. There's only about 19 or 20 guys working, so it's a it's not a it's not a huge um, as crew. You don't need a huge crew to manage a ship like that. And um, I learned a lot about ships, um, and I try to ex- explain a lot of that in the book, which you know is kind of fun. Um, now, are- um, go ahead. I was gonna say, are, now are we talking about these really large ships with the like with the containers on the deck, or or something a little smaller? No, this is an actually it's an earlier container ship. Um, I thought it was big, <laughs> you know, but <laughs> the new ones are four times bigger. I mean, uh, the the ship that I was on carried uh, twenty five hundred containers, something like that. The, the new ones are carrying twenty five thousand. And it's just to Whoa. give you an idea. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so it's just, uh, uh, and the ship that I was on was built back in, um, it was built in 2009, 2009, 2001. I, yeah, the trip I took was in 2010. So it was a nine year old ship. And for me, it was, uh, you know, gigantic. It was a long walk up to the, up to the bow. But um, I, I don't think I'd want to be on one of those Jagundo ones. They're just, um, um, I don't think you could ever reach the bow. <laughs> <laughs> Too much stuff in the way? <laughs> yeah, right. right. Uh, okay, you had another, another work, The Magnificent Doctor Wow, is that correct? That's wow, that's correct, that's correct. I was uh, hospitalized, uh, almost died um, in intensive care on a ventilator for uh, 10 days. Oh my! And, um, it had been a bleeding problem during a surgery, and uh, it just wouldn't stop. Um, so they, um, they they eventually saved me. Th- thank goodness. Um, yeah. But um, I was I know on a ventilator. You can't talk. Right. And um, writing was difficult uh, initially, especially because I was sedated, and you know I looked like chicken scratches writing. Um, but eventually, I was able to communicate my needs uh, in, to the to the staff uh, by you know, writing, and uh, they were very impressed that I could write in Spanish. They didn't know that I could speak Spanish, but they were impressed <laughs> <laughs> nonetheless. And uh, uh, I just survived all that by writing in my head. I wrote the book in my head. Um, Everything that happened to me while I was there and, and the different personalities around me. And uh, uh, it, it was uh, the only way I could really uh, keep my sanity. Although I have to tell you that I was being treated with so many steroids that I started hallucinating. Oh. And um, so I, I, I remembered the hallucinations. They were very vivid. Mm. And so I, I wrote about them, too. Oh my goodness! You have led such a fascinating life, and we have only scratched the surface. We haven't even discussed. I mean, you're a Cornell grad. Uh, you published poetry. You've been interviewed. Uh, you've been featured on Lisa Davis's uh, NPR program, Talk Healthy Today. You wrote a column for the Tico Times. So you 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 really have, I think, as we talked about earlier in the show. I think you really have opened something up within yourself, and you've and, and like a garden. You'll pardon me for torturing this metaphor, but you no, you have it. you have grown and you you have grown wild. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm 74 years old now, and I look back on my life and I say, well, it sure as hell was interesting, <laughs> <laughs> and I think it was also useful. I mean, I did some things that were that were useful for the, to the community. Um, 
you know, I feel I've contributed. And that's an important thing to feel as, as you come to the end of your life. Um, it's been a useful life as well oh. as, as well as interesting and funny at times. Yeah. You, you, yes. And listeners, there is so much more, so much more dimension, um, to Sandra and you must uh, check out uh, her most recent work here, of course, Evelio's garden, but do check out the other books I'm going to. There will be links in the show notes at mgopod.com. Uh, Sandra, I, I want to close out here, and sadly, I know that we're both busy people, so we got to get moving, but I wanted to ask you one last thing. Um, as someone who, United States native citizen, who, who made this tremendous move, this adventure, um, what can we do? If we let's say not everybody can move to Costa Rica, not everybody can move somewhere else. But what would you tell? What's the one thing you would tell people in the United States to do or to think about when it comes to our environment? I just think that it's really super important to try to personally connect to the environment. I mean, just go sit in a park. I mean, if you're yeah. a city dweller, just just give yourself a chance to to smell the green uh, in a park, to watch the watch the ducks and see what they're doing and just stop, stop everything else in your life for a half an hour mm. and uh, go touch a tree. There's a circulation going on in a tree that runs from the little roots down in the ground all the way up to the leaves on top. And it, it, it pins the, the tree to the, the earth. And it's a creature, it's a living thing. If we, if we feel more connected to the natural world, I think we'll feel more urgency about protecting it. And that would be certainly the message of Avelio's garden. Um, but that's what I want people to take away from it. And of course, uh, my personal garden did develop as, as uh, haphazardly as it, as it has been. <laughs> um, but I feel as if I'm finally beginning to enjoy its fruits. Uh, well, uh, I, I think you have led a magnificent life, and I am uh, privileged to have spoken with you today. And um, uh, Sandra, if, is uh, writingfromtheheart.net, is that the best way for folks to uh, get in touch with you or read up on you? I now have a website, uh, sandrashawhomer.com. So that's, a, that's another way that people can get in touch. And Very I'm on good. Facebook, and the books are on Facebook, and uh, Goodreads, and um, Amazon, and you know all of that so yeah i'm in all those places so people can find me well we're so glad you are sandra shaw homer is an environmental activist author adventurer and survivor and she's also been one of my favorite guests here on mysterious goings on thank you sandra thank you very much alex it's been a pleasure Okay, who has a podcast then writes an ebook about podcasting and doesn't do an audiobook version of it? Well, not me. I've done that. In fact, I'm very excited to tell you, dear listeners, that the podcast option, my recent top selling ebook on podcasting, my journey through 15 years as a podcaster, broadcaster, host, guest, and observer, is now an audible audiobook. It's really, really, really exciting for me to be able to present this to you through Audible, uh, which is available on Amazon.com, where the ebook link is as well. And in this fast listen, my experience uh, comes to you through stories, practical tips, and advice from my hundreds of hours as a guest, producer, podcast host, and more. And the podcast option, if I say so myself, is mandatory listening for those new to podcasting, and it should be a welcome addition to veteran podcasters' library. So check out the podcast option read by yours truly alex greenwood or as they say there the j alexander greenwood because that's my pen name and that's a long story which if you dig through my podcast eventually you'll find out what that means but the point being today the podcast option is available now as an audible audiobook i've got a link in the show notes to make it easy for you please do me a favor go get that audiobook or if audiobooks aren't your bag there's also a link for you to get it as an ebook. Again, the podcast option. I certainly hope you will choose it.
You know, I love podcasting. I have since 2006, back when you had to use like a Dixie cup with string to make the thing work. And that's why I'm so excited that we recently moved Mysterious Goings On to Anchor FM to record our podcast. I got to tell you, I don't regret it a bit. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First of all, it's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. And you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. I'm not going to lie to you, when I first heard about Anchor, I was a little dubious because I've been doing it the hard way for so long. But I got to tell you, it's very easy. Use a Stripe account get sponsors you're not paying monthly hosting fees the sound quality is great the distribution is phenomenal friends download the free anchor app today if you want to start your own podcast or go to anchor.fm to get started remember you heard it here first on mysterious goings on Thanks so much for listening to Mysterious Goings On. Don't forget we have a complete archive of all of our interviews, monologues, updates, live readings, dead readings. All of that stuff is available at mgopod.com. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to us so you never miss an episode. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all the usual suspects. Please join us there. Again, don't forget, mgopod.com also has links where to find me on social media and how to get in touch in case you want to be a guest here on the show. Well, I think it's time that I move on for this week, but until next time, keep reading.